Together, climate change and conflict threaten our ability to live. These crises aren't distinct, but intricately interwoven, fueling each other. But what are the threads that weave war and global warming together? And in particular, how do war and conflict change our climate? I'm Adam, a climate scientist with a PhD from Oxford, sharing what you need to know about climate change. And today I want to answer this question from a comment on my last video. Louise asked, I would love to know climate scientists' impressions, and most of all, see some good old data about the role played by the war industry on the climate crisis. So let's talk about it. How can war drive climate change? To be clear, I'm not going to get into how climate change could cause conflict. That's a topic for another video. Another video that I have actually already made. Link in the description as well as at the end of this video. Okay, so the first, and I reckon the most obvious question is, how militaries around the world drive emissions? Militaries use fossil fuels, which I mean, duh, everyone does. But is this fossil fuel use really such a big deal? And surprisingly, the answer is yes, it is. Added together, the world's militaries are estimated to be responsible for 5.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. That covers things like energy for military operations, transport and supply chains for equipment and weapons. As the study behind that stat puts it, if the world's militaries were a country, this figure would mean they have the fourth largest national carbon footprint in the world, greater than that of Russia. I said that this stat is surprising, and it is to me, but it turns out that you, my audience, are more savvy about these things than I am. The majority of you correctly guessed the scale of global military emissions. If you're not already a part of the Climate Adam community, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And while you're clicking on things, a like and a comment would go a long way to feeding the algorithm and making it happy. Our climate agreements don't actually cover these military emissions, which means militaries don't have to cut their emissions or even come clean about how much they're polluting, though there is an active push from environmental groups to change that. And beyond the resource use of militaries, there's also a whole host of ways that war itself can cause climate-changing emissions. This can be very difficult to calculate since it's often not direct and also can vary hugely from war to war, conflict to conflict. For example, burning vegetation, targeting fossil fuel infrastructure, the huge task of delivering humanitarian aid to those who desperately need it. And then after a conflict, of course, there's the energy needed to rebuild what's been lost. For example, in Gaza, the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs reported that after just a few weeks of conflict, the Israeli military assault had destroyed or damaged almost half of Gaza's housing. Wars don't just contribute to climate change through the emissions they cause. War can also be used as a means to gain access to fossil fuels. The invasion of Iraq is a devastating example of this. Many argue that the war was motivated, at least in part, by a desire to secure the country's oil reserves. The war and its consequences have been estimated to have cost at least 100,000 their lives. But conflict also influences climate change indirectly. By fighting each other, we weaken our fight against climate change, and cash is a prime example of this. It's not uncommon to hear from our politicians that we can't afford climate action. They want to take away your car and put millions of Americans out of work. I mean, this is a nonsense argument anyway, as I've made clear many times on this channel. I mean, if we can't afford climate action, what on earth would make you think we can afford climate change? And indeed, a lot of work shows that countries decarbonizing would actually save them huge amounts of money, thanks to stimulating the economy, protecting people from air pollution, and, you know, stopping the climate from changing. But it is true that transitioning away from fossil fuels means spending money up front, and governments hate spending money up front. 
except they don't really. Take the United States, which is a great example because it is both the biggest historical emitter and has the highest military spending of any country. One estimate puts the price tag of decarbonizing the United States at 4.5 trillion dollars. Again, that's ignoring the huge financial benefits which would come from this. So yeah, that is a huge chunk of money. But looked at another way, that's only what the United States spends on defense in around five or six years. And I think it's a pretty open question which use of money would actually help defend the lives and well-being of Americans better. This isn't just an issue for how countries fight climate change within their own borders. Wealthy nations often bankroll wars waged by other countries. For example, the United States just recently voted a deal that would provide billions of dollars of military aid for Israel. This stands in stark contrast to the weak support that high-income countries offer to combat climate change. Wealthy nations promised lower-income countries $100 billion in climate finance by 2020 and still haven't coughed up the cash about three years later. And so whether at home or abroad, we see how easy it is for countries to open up their wallets for war and how much countries resist paying to protect the planet. It's not all about carbon and cash either. War hurts our climate efforts by halting cooperation too. I feel like it's kind of stating the obvious, but it's already incredibly hard to get the world to come together to fight climate change, with so many competing interests from the biggest emitters to the countries that face the worst climate catastrophes. But when you throw conflicts into the mix, like the current Israel-Hamas conflict or the Russian invasion of Ukraine, tensions soar even further and threaten to derail already fragile deals. And these threats to diplomacy have real consequences. As the International Energy Agency put it in a recent report, there is no low international cooperation route to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. While we're talking about cooperation, I just want to shout out my incredible team of patrons over on Patreon. Since I don't want to sell you things with product placements or ads, the incredible support of patrons like Matthew Cracknell and Michelle makes this channel possible. If you'd like to join them, the link is up here. I want to touch briefly on a question of war that I'm sometimes asked, which teaches us a lot about climate change. How does the heat produced by weapons affect our climate? Let's look at a colossal example, the nuclear bomb that the United States dropped on Hiroshima. This bomb exploded with an energy of 15 kilotons of TNT, just huge amounts of heat produced in that one devastating instant. So how does that compare to the energy our planet is building up due to global warming? Well, the heating effects of the greenhouse gases we're emitting are as if we were detonating five of these atomic bombs every single second. I don't say this to draw some kind of equivalence between the horrors of nuclear war and climate change, but just to give a sense of the vast scale of just how far we're shifting our planet out of balance. Look, in so many ways, conflict and war are fueling climate change, whether it's the emissions that they drive, the money they soak up, or the fact that they derail international collaboration. But more and more climate scientists, policymakers, and activists are understanding that these crises are deeply interlinked, and that the fight for climate justice is deeply connected to the fight for peace. And on that note, I'd like to share something personal about this fight for justice. In this video, and in general on this channel, I aim to give you the information that you need in a relatively impartial way, so that you can decide what to do with that information. And I try to stick to climate changey things. But there are some things that aren't purely climate change related, that I'm just not impartial about, but that I feel it's vital for me to talk about nevertheless. If that's not your thing, feel free to stop watching this video at this point. Here's a nice dose of climate change related information for you. 
I don't feel impartial about conflict and war. The suffering that they cause breaks my heart. And so I was appalled by the deadly attacks in Israel on October 7th by Hamas, an organization that I abhor. I have also been horrified by the Israeli strikes on Gaza, the targeting of civilian infrastructure, and the widespread killing and immense suffering that this has caused. As a Jewish person, it's shocked me to hear people claim that this violence is somehow being carried out in my name, or argue that denouncing this violence is equivalent to anti-Semitism. So it's important that I say clearly that it is absolutely not in my name. I deeply believe that violence cannot be a solution to the suffering and that we must protect all civilian lives at all costs. And so I absolutely believe we need to fight for a total ceasefire and a return of all hostages. But more than that, we need to fight for a solution that provides long-lasting peace and, crucially, freedom for all people living in the region, Jewish, Christian and Muslim, Israeli and Palestinian. This includes environmental freedoms and justice, such as safe access to land and resources that has so often been denied Palestinians. We also have to overcome the wave of hatred we're seeing rising the world over in the form of anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim and anti-Arab discrimination and violence. This isn't new to this video, but it's worth saying explicitly, commenters promoting hatred or violence of any kind will be removed. Thank you for staying with me for that bit. It really means a lot. And I want to say, if you found the topics in this video challenging, I can only stress how valuable community can be to help support you in those feelings and to join forces to push for change. In this video, I've been discussing how conflicts are driving climate change, but what about the other way around? How climate change drives conflict? Well, check out the video that I made with my pal Zenturo over here. Okay, until next time. Bye. Oh my gosh, that was a lot.